Join us, friends. Great Scott Spa Guy. Do they know what we have in store for them? They will if they tighten up. And don't double dribble. To the Grey Ghost Spa Guy? Exactly, old chum. No time to waste. To the Grey Ghost. We have not a minute to spare. It's showtime, friends. All right, all right, all right. It is the Spa Guy, but it is not Trey today. He is on location filming and not able to get with us when we're recording this. But I'm going to bring in some friends of mine. I have uh, Daniel and Carrie. And y'all have a YouTube channel. And yes, we've been friends for, for uh, many years. And y'all came to uh, some, I met y'all at Elvis events at the dojo. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, so that's, I think, I think that's the first time I met y'all was at the dojo, right? I think so. Yeah, it was. Um, I don't know if you remember this, but the first time that we met you, <laughs> Daniel, I know you remember this. We had come into, it was before the hard opening of the dojo. So okay. it was, we were doing some tours like before it actually opened up earlier in the summer that year. Um, and we were huge Spa Guy fans. And so oh, we came sure. in and you were in the back and we were talking to the person at the front, like with our tickets and we heard your voice. You said something like um, telling something to her and we both looked at each other and we were like, hey, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> God, oh, and she was like i think we're you were out, yeah. out here. <laughs> um, but yeah we, we totally made dorks of ourselves and well, <laughs> I, I appreciate it it's i, I appreciate y'all watching and being so um uh, y'all have been very encouraging uh all these years and i do appreciate that i do you're welcome and uh and tell us the name of your channel before let's make sure we don't let forget that okay go for it Oh, sure. Our channel is called Trav Elvis. Um, we started it over the summer. It's still pretty small and fledgling, but we've been having a lot of fun with it. Um, yeah, Trav we're, Elvis. T R A Travel Elvis. Trav Elvis. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I'll put a link to that down in the description area, by the way. So if you're listening to this or watching this, uh, the link to their channel will be down in there. And, uh, and so tell us about y'all being Elvis fans. <laughs> oh, well, are you, yeah. do you want me to tell the story yeah yeah if, if you could, yeah <laughs> okay he hates when i tell this story um yeah. so you have, you have to tell the quick version oh um, <laughs> <laughs> so i would say that before we actually took our first trip to memphis we were probably both casual fans more in the sense that everybody is um but we hadn't really gone in the weeds or you know once you cross the line with all this and you really go in the rabbit hole you never come out um, <laughs> and we had not reached what, that what point. do you mean <laughs> <laughs> I have the foggiest idea. um and we actually were going to nashville we always wanted to do that we thought it'd be fun um and so we had planned a trip to nashville and i felt like well if we're gonna be so close to memphis i mean why don't we just like you know go the extra couple of hours and see graceland it would be really fun you know and somebody was like really cranky and why would we want to do that um and <laughs> giving me a really hard time about it and i was like no 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 it's gonna be fun you'll love it i promise it's gonna be good um and even like when we pulled into the parking lot i remember when we were like buying our tickets somebody was like cranky and well i can't believe you're making me do this and, <laughs> well, what did i say <laughs> that, <laughs> and, oh, uh -oh. <laughs> that's my karma for making fun of you i guess um, <laughs> I'm <talking> about <laughs> um but um but yeah so we went we did the tour it was really cool um and it was funny because we didn't talk about elvis very much when we got home but i remember like Maybe a couple of weeks afterwards, I think it was sort of settling in for you. You were like, you know, I've been thinking a lot about Elvis, um, you know, and so then it just kind of it really snowballed. We fell very hard, very fast. Um, and about <laughs> two months to the date later from the first time we went to Graceland, he looked at me and he was like, you know, I just don't think we got the full experience. I think we need to go back and do the VIP tour. So we did that like two months after we'd gone the first time. And now we've been to Memphis, I don't know, a gazillion times and we've, we've got it bad. Um, yeah. so that's how yeah. it all started. The big gets then, on you. I've always said you can't dabble in Elvis. You're either oh, no. all the way out. Well, it gets yeah. you, you know, once it gets yeah. its hooks into you. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. You know, after a while, it's like you're that deep in it. And then you're like, well, why don't we do a channel, you know? And, yeah. And, uh, and and our channel is like it's 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 Trav Elvis and we talk about Elvis. He's like the the core of it. But we do other things too. We talk about other celebrities, old Hollywood mysteries and crimes and different things, kitsch, what you know, whatever. But 
a lot of it ties back to Elvis or has that Elvis connection or that kind of thing, you know? So we're kind of fleshing out his world a little bit. Yeah. And I just kind of, we don't really have a formula, like just different interesting parts of the story that have kind of caught my fancy through the years. Um, you know, things I've been curious and finding out more about. Sometimes it's a good excuse to research things more and go a little bit deeper in the weeds. Um, so it's been really fun. Um, and I know y'all traveled across the country one time and filmed some things. I remember that. And one thing that specific that I remember that you re filmed was that Prada thing that's out in the desert somewhere. In oh, Marfa. Yeah. 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 In Marfa. Yeah. Marfa, Texas. Yeah, Marfa. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, it's Prada Marfa, I guess is the name of it. Yeah. They, um, uh, a couple it's of just German like a store um, uh, uh, with like a single item. Is it one shoe in it or something? A product? It's shoe? got several. It's got several shoes, uh, pairs of shoes, and several handbags. Yeah, and, and then uh, it's just freestanding. There's nobody there. It's just nobody like there. It's sealed. You can't go in it. But it's but it's decked out like it's a show space, you know. And uh, it's just bizarre. Two two German um, artists um, collaborated on it, you know, uh, I don't know, it might have been in the 80s, I'm not sure, um, as just kind of a conceptual piece, uh, you know, kind of a site-specific thing, taking something familiar and then dropping it in this, you know, incongruous space, yeah. you know, and, um, and, you know, it's one of those things I always wanted to see. There's certain pieces of art around the country, and Marfa is a big art town, and I kind of wanted to go there, but I didn't think I would. But when we did our big trip, it's like, oh, you know what? Let's just go through Marfa. And we actually stopped there in the middle of the night. And yeah, I remember all your photographs. Yeah, really. It's particularly yeah. surreal at night, you know? Um, so yeah, that actually it's turned out lit up. Yeah, they keep yeah. It's lit up. It's, you know, I mean, it's. You can do everything but buy shoes there, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And pulling up at it at night, I mean, you're kind of on this deserted road and it's out in the middle of nowhere and it's all lit up. It's it's really interesting, really cool. It place. is. That's bizarre. And I think yeah. the first time I ever saw it was was y'all's trip. Oh, and, no. I, and I looked at it and went, oh. what is that? Yeah. And I started looking. And since then, I've seen a lot of times it's possible. Yeah. But before, well, yeah, I've never seen it before, to, to yeah, my it's knowledge. Like a a photo op, but I hadn't seen anybody there at night before, so that was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. And, well, I mean, it's eerie, you know. At yeah. night, it's really eerie, you know, because it's like the desert, you know. Yeah, when you're just there, and uh, yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of one of those places that people go to and you know get pictures and stuff. Interesting. But, uh, really yeah, cool. Martha is a great town for art too. If you're interested in art, you know, there's a you know, a lot of galleries there and stuff. Those yeah. famous artists that moved there and started a foundation and stuff, Donald Judd. So there's a lot of stuff there if you're into art. Yeah. There's and the best things. burrito restaurant in the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a good burrito place there too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just a whole you, now, you were in, was when you were in Richmond in school, was that art school? Yeah. Okay. So you're an artist as well. Yeah. I've okay. got a I've got an MFA in painting from uh, yeah. Watch your mouth, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can bleep that out. Uh, yeah, at this point, I think it's a dirty word, but uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, I went to VCU, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University School of the Arts, and got a painting degree back in the nineties, so thousand years ago. Interesting. So yeah. you do art? Yes. Okay. Is that a your piece behind you? No, no. <laughs> this, we put we put this up to uh, to uh, dampen the the glare uh, from the lights. Oh, I see. Okay. And uh, so we we need a new drop backdrop. But uh, no, I do. I mean, I've done a little bit of everything. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm a painter. But uh, you know, I do. I use whatever. You know, I'll, I'll do sculptural things. I, I've done installation, video, um, site specific stuff, uh, public art. Um, I do a lot of 2D stuff too. Um, I uh, a few years ago I had some blackboards. Uh, they were paintings, but they looked like blackboards, and they were interactive. You could draw on them yourself or go erase uh, what other people did. But I had my own images on there too, so it was an interactive experience. You know, stuff like that. It's kind of kind of not traditional mm -hmm. art. So, and so I think this is a good uh, uh, segue into. You had an experience when you were in art school, yeah, with a young lady named Barbara. 
Yeah. Tell us, tell us a little bit about that experience. And y'all have this story on your channel too, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, we wound up making a video about it. Um, I and in that thought, video, you go there, right? Yeah, we. Okay. I go. What we did was, uh, at the time, I was living in um, a community in Richmond called The Fan. Um, it's kind of a fan-shaped uh, area uh, next to VCU. It's, it's, uh, it's practically VCU campus, you know, because it's right there. Uh, and I was living there. And, um, and I had a friend named Barbara. Her name is Barbara Powers. And she was in the painting program with me. And uh, we were friends, you know, um, and, you know, I, we had some classes together and got to know each other. And um, I was working, I was like a prep chef at a, uh, at a restaurant and I got her a job, you know, and stuff like that. So we were, you know, she was, she was a good friend. And, um, you know, I was living, I was living in the fan and I was laying there one night, you know, the, the clock didn't mean anything. I could be awake any time of day or night, you know? And uh, so it was Typical like 1.30. Artist. Hmm? Typical artist. Yeah, you know, it's like <laughs> caution to the wind. So um, it was like 1.30 in the morning and I was reading a book and I got tired and I said, you know what, I'm gonna go for a walk. So I, I walked outside and just kind of out of habit, I, I, I walked towards campus, you know? Um, and I'm walking along and then, you know, I heard some yelling, you know, and uh, which you hear a lot on an urban campus, you know, you're in the city. Um, it's usually a party or revelry or some, you know, something. Um, but uh, so it, it didn't dawn on me at first, but after a while I started listening and I'm walking and, and she's saying, it's a, it's a female voice and she's screaming, oh my God. And um, I keep walking and, and then I, but I realize, you know, it's like, oh, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this. This is, this is not a good Oh my God, you know, it's, it's not a casual thing. Something's not right here. So I found myself kind of jogging. I um, I got to a corner and there was a side street and I could tell it was coming from down there. So I went down there and it started to happen more and more. She's screaming, it's louder. And so at some point I just found myself running, you know, just full out running. And I came up to a, a street and I could see across the street um, two figures in silhouette. And uh, because there was a street light beyond them, and so that I could kind of tell, and um, and it looked like a, a looked like a, a man and a woman, you know, it was a, a larger figure had this woman up against a car. And by this point, I'm just you know, fall out across the street, and I see the guy's head snap, and I can tell that he's seen me, you know, and, and so he takes off running directly away from me, and I run up to where they were, but I kind of keep going, you know, because I'm chasing him. And then he ducks down this alley and I get to the alley and I look and there's nothing. Right. Uh, it's a long alley. There's another lamp down at the end of it. And I so if someone was there, I could see their silhouette again. I see nothing. So I'm like, well, he's hiding or he's ducked through a yard or something and he's got the advantage now. So uh, it gave me pause. And I thought, well, what about the girl? So I turned around and went to look for the girl. And um, and so I got to where they were and I didn't see her. It was like she vanished, you know. Um, and so I'm like, well, where did she go? And I, I walked between the cars. The cars are parked, you know, on the side of the, the street there. And I squeeze in between two cars. And I notice as I, I'm going, it's a white car. And I noticed this smear all the way across the hood. And um, I get to the other side and she's lying there on the ground in, in the road by the by the driver's side tire um and you know you know i won't go into the to the details but i mean there was a lot of blood and you couldn't recognize who it was like if you knew them you wouldn't be able to tell because their face was completely covered um yet there was something familiar seeming about her and but I didn't dwell on that right now because I'm like, what's wrong? You know, I get I get down next to her and um, and she's not moving. She's just staring straight up. And um, and all of a sudden she starts, you know, kind of heaving her chest heaves. And she's and it startled me a little bit, you know, because she was dead still. And um, and then she stopped. And anyway, then I hear some people or they're, they're sticking their heads out the door and going, hey, is, is everything OK or. I'm like, no, someone's hurt. Get an ambulance. And, you know, uh, but I knew 
you know, I knew there was no point because uh, she she wasn't going to make it. I mean, she had been stabbed uh, severely. Um, and so I was holding her hand looking for a pulse and she kind of heaved a little more and then she died. Mm. And, um, and I waited a long time. It seemed like it, it might not have been that long, but, you know, a situation like that, it seems like a long time. Police officer finally arrived and he kind of blocked the street and what and said, you know, someone hurt. And I'm like, well, dead, actually. And we walked over there and he clicked his light on to look at her. And, you know, I've been seeing her in the yellow street lamp, you know, and so the blood looked brown. Uh, and that torch light hit her. I mean, it was the most shocking red you've ever seen, you know. And uh, he clicked it off and walked on back and kind of left me standing there. And so I'm like, so I follow him, you know. And um, we get back to the car and, you know, he's not really asking me anything or, or asking any questions. You know, in, in my mind at this point, yeah, I've been thinking for a while, all right, well, I'm going to be downtown. I'm going to be at the precinct. I'm going to be questioned. They might even think I'm a sub a suspect. I mean, because I was the only one here, you know. Um, and, you know, he was kind of disinterested seeming. I'm like, well, do you want my information or my name or, you know? And he's like, oh, oh yeah, yeah. And he pulls out a pad and jots it all down and then does, still doesn't say anything. He had called for a backup or something. And I'm standing there. And finally, I'm like, well, am I free to go? And he's like, oh, yeah, you can go. And I'm like. Okay, so I walked home, you know, and um, so to wrap this up, uh, the next day I was gallery sitting because the professors there in the uh, painting and printmaking department, they belonged to a co-op gallery and they would pay some of their students to gallery sit for them because that was one of their duties, but they could farm it out to us and we needed the money, you know. So I was there gallery sitting for this guy and the phone rang and it was the chairman of the painting and printmaking department. And he said, hey, I heard about what happened. You know, I just wanted to call and see if you were all right. And uh, and I was like, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it is, you know, what can you say, you know? And we were talking about it a little bit. And he finally said, oh, yeah, it's really hard when it's one of your own. And I, I stopped and I'm like, and then it dawned on me who it was. Mm. Uh, some part of my brain knew who it was. Mm -hmm. But I was like, my brain said, no, nope, we'll deal with that later. Right now, we got to deal with this, you know. Mm -hmm. As soon as he said that, I said, who was it? But I knew, you know, he said it was Barbara Powers. And I was like, yeah, yeah it was, you know. Yeah. And um, and the, the odd thing was, I didn't know anything about it, but apparently 20 minutes before that, there had been an attack uh, a couple of streets over where a, a knife wielding assailant tried to uh, uh, accost this woman as she was trying to get in her house and she fought him off and got in the house and he left on a bike and uh, presumably it's the same guy there was no bike in my encounter but you know he could have ditched the bike anywhere mm -hmm. um, and come to find out too that they had canvassed the area uh, looking for anybody who saw anything, who knew anything, who any witnesses, anything. And I got, I heard none of this, you know, none of you ever got back to me. In fact, I tried to give them my information and, you know, that particular That's officer crazy. was very disinterested. I don't know. <clears throat> it was kind of bizarre, you know, it was the exact opposite of what you would think mm -hmm. you would encounter under those circumstances, you know. Uh, but anyway, you know, it's unsolved. It's still unsolved. It's unsolved. And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I can't imagine that it ever would be solved. I mean, I, you know, he took the knife with him. He probably didn't leave any DNA. You know, this was 88. I think it was 88. I can't remember the exact. It was, I think it was 88. Um, and, um, but if anybody knows anything about this, they can contact you. Yeah, feel free. I mean, years later, I, I contacted the police because uh, they didn't know I existed. And, um, and that cop, whoever was, should be fired for that. He didn't do anything at all. And I and I don't mean this to reflect on the, the Richmond Police Department in general, but that particular officer was very, you know, 
you know, behaved very oddly, you know, and, yeah. and, and, you know, I mean, at this time I'm what, 20, you know, I'm like 20 years old. So, you know, I kind of know what's happening, but at the same time, I'm kind of stupid too, you know? And uh, so I'm like, well, I guess if he doesn't, you know, I mean, so I just left and, uh, and I always thought about that, you know, because her parents, her mother died. Um, but, you know, her parents spent all that time not knowing what happened, really, you know, they in essence. But but they didn't. But they spent that time not knowing that somebody that knew her that was actually a friend was actually there when she died mm -hmm. and she didn't actually die alone. And uh, but I never did talk to their her parents. Um, and what wound up happening, too, is, like I said, she was a. Uh, a student in the painting and printmaking program and I was doing work study there at the office and they actually sent me to uh, one of the painting studios to, to, to gather up all of her paintings and put them in a storage closet because her parents were come to, coming to pick them up. And, uh, and, and they, I, I thought it odd that they sent me because uh, they knew, you know, but I did it. Uh, and her paintings were these, you know, what these large figures that, that looked like they were in agony and 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 but with other consoling figures like holding them and and you know is very uh surreal and you know kind of experience in light of everything but um but yeah you know it's just one of those things that you carry with you and you know many years after the fact you know i tried to i tried to um uh, to do something about it. When we started the channel, I thought, well, you know what, I'm going to do a video. So what we wound up doing is I got, you know, we went back to the street where it happened, uh, Plum Street in, uh, in the fan. And I started where I was living on Hanover and I walked the path all the way to the location where, where it occurred and just kind of narrated what happened, you know, and explained it all and then walked, you know. So, um, and I don't know, I figured maybe if, uh, if her family's out there, you know, it gets back to them maybe it's something that you know it's something mm -hmm. I, it's uh they've had nothing for a long time yeah that but, was a terrible situation she and you know she was a really nice sweet girl you know um smart and outgoing and just you know She's one of those people that you can't even imagine saying something bad about, you know, I mean, she just, everybody liked her, you know, she's one of those types, you know, and, uh, you know, and, you know, and oddly, you know, I've done many things in my life, but at, at present I'm doing security work and, um, and, you know, this situational awareness and security and stuff like that, you know, I've thought about it for a long time, you know, and, um, you know, if you send your kids off to college, you know, talk to them about mm -hmm. about like she could have she took a shortcut through the fan so, so let's back up uh, and i want to bring up something she was the manager of a punk rock band she and had, they had practiced that night and she was walking home she was walking home from that and that was very odd too because that was like totally not her kind of thing but she was branching out and dressing different and doing different things and she was you know she was growing up you know and she had taken on this this manager you know the job like you said with this punk rock band the undertakers the name of that band Oddly. And, yeah. yeah and um and she was walking home and she took a shortcut through the unlit streets you know there were lights but not lit like the main street on campus you know where she could have walked you know in the well-lit area and she'd be alive you know but uh she went in the place that you dark catacombs, you know, where there's a, mm -hmm. a lamp here and there, you know, but um, yeah, I mean, you just got to be aware of your surroundings all the time, you know, R regardless of where you are, you know, mm -hmm. if you're, if you're out somewhere, scan, or, scan your environment and look as, as far out as you can see, you know, what's the most distant thing, just take it all in, mm -hmm. just be aware, you know, because uh, this didn't have to happen. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, it was so avoidable. And uh, and yeah, you know, it's just one of those things, you know, I mean, that guy might be in jail for something else. He might be dead. Who knows? But uh, but they'll never get him for this. You know? mm -hmm. 
So y'all did, did a story on to change the, the let's let's go to y'all did a story on Natalie Wood. You kind yeah. of studied that. So tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. Um, that was, that's a subject I've been interested in since I was a really small child. I always loved Natalie Wood. I loved her movies. Um, I was always interested in her life and I knew that there was some mystery surrounding her death. Um, interestingly, as, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. There's a couple of Elvis connections here. Yeah. 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 That's one of them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And, um, so I've always followed that. I followed when the case was reopened. Um, you know, I followed all of the information that's been available about it. And so we did a video about it early on. And interestingly enough, when we did that video, um, I got a comment from a viewer who had recommended this book called Brainstorm, an investigation into the death of film star Natalie Wood, um, which is a, a newer book. It's It's been published over the past few years. And it's by a really delightful gentleman named Sam Peroni. Um, he's a former federal prosecutor mm. who had spent about three years just sort of investigating this with his own resources on his own time. Um, um, because he was curious about it. He was also a longtime fan of Natalie's. Um, and so he wrote a book about it and I ordered it. I read it. It was, I thought it was very interesting. It had a lot of information that I know people are not familiar with new things, interesting things he found in his research. Um, and we contacted him. There was an email on his website. He was very friendly. He wrote us back. Um, he ended up being on we're actually doing a series of interviews with him about his investigation um, we've published a few of them we've got hours and hours and hours of content with him in the fan in the can i'm sorry you were talking about the fan yeah. before right. um, in the can um but um but yeah i mean he's just been really generous with his time and sharing his information so we've got all kinds of information from him about his investigation things that didn't make it in the book because he ran out of space um, so that's been really cool. We, we met him um, actually when we went to Memphis in January for birthday week. He's in Arkansas. So we just drove the few extra oh, hours. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Very, very, very smart. Very interesting man. Um, yeah, he's got a he's got a baseball diamond there. Uh, yeah. In his backyard. <laughs> yeah, Peroni Field. And, and they, they do little league championships there and stuff. He's hmm. he's kind of a he's kind of a local celebrity. We're not celebrity, but he's known, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got a lot of high contacts and stuff. And uh, and the interesting thing is, you know, he was a, he was a prosecutor and a defense attorney and an assistant uh, um, attorney, uh, U.S. attorney in Arkansas. Um, yeah. OK. And so this guy's got a lot of experience in criminal justice. And so he brought that stuff to bear on this investigation. And, you know, he sued the uh, Los Angeles Sheriff's Department to release files and to have access to files that, that, that they had on the case um, and successfully and found out a lot of things. And one of the things he found out was that there's this uh, there's this author named Suzanne Finstead who wrote Child Bride mm -hmm. uh, of Elvis fame. Right. But she also wrote a book called Natasha about Natalie Wood and she was going to update it and i think she was trying to to beat his book to press um and in her original book she uh exonerates you know robert wagner and, and uh and believes it was an accident and all this stuff and in her, her follow-up book which is called natalie wood i think um she changes her mind entirely and said no he's guilty and here's why um but you know, in the course of his investigation, not only did he find out a lot more than she found out because he knew what he was doing, for one thing, uh, in terms of investigating, because he'd been doing it for so long. And he also knew criminal law and he knew some of the instruments that he could use to get access to things. And he got access to so much, in fact, that he has found discrepancies between what her interview subjects have said and what she put in her book that they said. Mm -hmm. So apparently she has changed their words. And this is not just one person. This is several people. She's changed their testimony. She's put words in their mouth. 
and they swear up and down. And and he he's had these people deposed and and under oath they've said no, I did not say that. You know, mm. so he's found all these discrepancies for one thing, and that's that's important for 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 one reason. One, it's like you're a biographer, you're writing a book about someone's life. It's not fiction, and you have a responsibility to represent that in good faith. And if there's evidence that you have, you know, betrayed that responsibility and changed people's testimony, especially when there's a death involved, um, to me, your credibility goes down the tubes. Mm -hmm. And this is an author which many people, not everybody, but many people in the Elvis community respect because of the Child Bride book. Mm -hmm. And I think Gary can address some of the things that are wrong with that book, but my point that I was to tie it up with was that, you know, if she's willing to do that with this book and this investigation. Yeah. What would she do? You know, take what she says That's with a grain of salt. Yeah. And I think she, she's, she's writing where she thinks the money is, mm -hmm. you know, it's um, if this is a better story, Hey, I'll make it a better story. I'll sell more books, you know? And I, I don't say that, you know, loosely, it's not even my my findings. This Sam Peroni, this prosecutor, found it in the course. He wasn't even looking for this. He admired her work, too, because she um, did dig up some good stuff and contributed to the story in a positive way uh, over the years. And he was, you know, willing to work with her. In fact, in fact, he reached out to her and she blew him off. But it, through the course of his investigation, he's like, wait a minute, this doesn't, this stuff doesn't add up, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, but that, and let me let me just throw this in real quick. Um, and by the way, you know, um, if you think you've heard everything about the Natalie Wood story, read this book or watch the video interviews with him, because it looks like to us, and certainly to him, this story he has all kinds of of evidence that this thing was around the ground on purpose. It wasn't actually investigated. Strings were pulled. People knew people intimidated people. The LASD backed off of it. Our, um, Robert Wagner was able to construct this narrative and by the skin of his teeth, make it stick. And, um, and really, once you read Sam's book, you have a you have to do go through many, so many more contortions to make them innocent than you do. It really is fascinating. Um, and to be fair, one thing I do want to say, there are several Natalie Wood books um, out there. Most of them came out, or they actually all came out after Miss Finstead's book. And they all have an agenda. You know, I, I, I do want to say this. It's definitely a case of having to separate the wheat from the chaff. Many of the books that were written after hers were really written to contradict things that she said, to, um, you know, sugarcoat some information she had. And I do want to say that I also greatly admired the book Natasha. Um, I, I think that she really did bring out some important things. You know, I think it is something that had a lot of bearing on the case eventually getting reopened and drawing some things to the light. So I do respect it as a work. Um, you know, and I always think it's important when we're talking about that to mention that. Um, however, you know, I think also at this case, when it comes to the Natalie Wood case, the way that I see this is at this point, it's pretty obvious this case is never going to be resolved. It's never going to trial. Um, you know, there's never going to be any re official resolution from the authorities with it, you know, and, and I think we know that. I mean, I think in the court of public opinion, people have an idea of what they think happened, you know, um, but it's definitely not something that there's ever going to be real justice on. And so I think at this point, the best that can be done is to try to preserve what we know of the facts to the best degree that we know them, um, you know, in as unvarnished a form as we possibly can, um, just to have that record there, which is one of the reasons I really wanted to get Mr. Peroni on tape talking about the things that he found, especially some of the things he didn't put in his book, because um, just to kind of have a collection of what we know and, you know, the best that we know. Um, I think it is important for that reason. And so I also think that in terms of for people who are really interested in this case and really go in the weeds and things like that and want to know all the details, I think that it is important to have an idea of where discrepancies have been found in all the published works about it, um, you know, just to help get the clearest idea of, of what we think happened. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he said his goal was really um, 
because he knows he knows Robert Wagner is not going to be brought to trial. Uh, no, but never his, his goal was he he wanted uh, an inquest, uh, a coroner's mm -hmm. inquest, to be to be convened and uh, re-examine the evidence. And he's convinced that if he could get that to happen, um, he could have the 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 manner of death changed on her death certificate. And to him, that would be some modicum of so change it to murder. Um, homicide. Homicide. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. basically there's, there's several reasons why, but the, to cut to the chase answer is, uh, if he had, he doesn't, he doesn't even have to push her in the water. If he had anything to do with the circumstances interacting with her, and then she wound up in the water, she fell, she slipped, whatever. And he did not take any action to save her. California says that's homicide. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. yeah. And that and alone. So a couple of different things is uh, first, the lady that you're talking about that wrote Child Bride, sure. that, that name of the book is Whitwam because she wasn't a child bride. She was 21 years old when she got married. Yeah, absolutely. That. Yeah, you know, absolutely. It's sensationalistic, isn't it? Yeah. And it's sensationalistic. Uh, that, that just lets you know that she writes things from a a standpoint of trying to get you to buy it, sensationalize it. So that I would discount the book just on that alone. You know, well, right, you know, right she, go, she goes in hard on all this stuff with that guy in Germany and all those things. I let, let Carrie speak to that, but she goes in that so hard, you know, and I think part of the reason she does is to sell books, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is uh, a, a very little known fact is Christopher Walken was on the boat at the time. Christopher Walken was on the boat. There, there yeah. were four people on the boat. Natalie, Robert Wagner, they call him RJ. Um, Dennis Deverne, who was the skipper of the boat, for lack of a better term. Uh, he was in the employ of the of the Wagners. And, you know, um, and Christopher Walken was their guest that night. And uh, and we've been to Catalina. We've got we've done some videos. We we went to the spot where she drowned. We went to uh, the island. We went to the the uh, Doug's Harbor Reef where yeah. they had dinner that night. Uh, we had dinner there, uh, and we shot all this footage. What it looks like today. Uh, that's that's in some of our videos. And it's it's it was fascinating. You know, it's uh, that's Avalon is on one end of the island, which is very touristy and very built up you know it's like a it, it's great you know but then there's two harbors on the other end and it's secluded and not much going on there you know and it was uh it was fascinating to be there i mean it hasn't changed very much from the pictures you know mm -hmm. and, and their table the bar everything that's still there you know and so you've got videos i knew you've had i haven't watched those but i knew that they were there that's yeah we've, i'll go back and check those out yeah, we've got a long version and then we've got a shorter version for people who are just more interested in the island itself and the, you know, because we, I mean, there's a there's a point there called Blue Cavern Point and her body was found right off of it. Hmm. Uh, and we just, you know, we we document all that and um, for what it looks like now, as, it, that is as of 2023. Hmm. And um, and it was a it was kind of an eerie and uh, an interesting experience, you know, finally seeing these places and, and, mm -hmm. and recording that, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Going there brings the story to life, especially if you've read about something and then yeah. you can go there. It kind of opens it up and, and gives you a, a new perspective on the whole thing. Sure. Yeah. And for me, it really brought to mind, I'd, I'd read all the books. And so I'd read so many descriptions of the island and the logistics and things like that. But but I, I didn't really appreciate how small it was, um, how close to the shore the drowning really happened at. Um, yeah. You know, and it, you, you really see that she could have been saved. This was very preventable. Um, there was no reason why this should have happened the way that it did. Um, yeah. She, she wasn't found that far from the boat, really. No, it was no. just, a, I mean, really, it's just a, a, you know, maybe a, I don't know, a few hundred yards maybe, but I mean, it's, hmm. cause the boat was far out in the, in the, so uh, could she not swim or do you think she just got tired? What do you think happened? Well, she, she couldn't swim um, or at least she couldn't swim well. 
uh, and the water, it was, a, it was kind of a windy, cold, rainy night, and the water was very cold, so hypothermia would have set in quickly. And, um, and that's panic and hypothermia is probably what did her in. Mm. Um, and once she went in the water, however she went in the water, uh, no one helped her. Mm -hmm. um, and there were some ear witnesses, uh, that is some people, uh, Mar uh, Marion Wayne, and um, I can't remember the other gentleman's name, but, but we've John got, Payne. what was it? John Payne. John, John Payne. Payne. Yeah, it was like, Mar yeah, uh, Marilyn. Uh, Wayne and John Payne was reported. Yeah, okay. And um, yeah, they heard stuff going on and, and they thought they recognized it as, uh, you know, them, you know. Um, they recognize the voices uh because they're famous and um and you know the stuff she heard was just kind of ignored or glossed over um sam had them deposed and has her um uh, her um testimony on video um for that matter um he had um uh suzanne finstead uh deposed mm -hmm. And under oath, and he's got that on video, and we have uh, excerpts from that in our video. Uh, and he also cites, uh, you know, her story of how she got the information, which she didn't publish in her first book. In her second book, she tells of how she got this information back when she was writing the first one, and what she got, how she got it, the whole description, everything. The judge listened to it and said, mm, this is incredible because that's not how we do things. You know, she described all this stuff and the, and the, the judge dismissed her as her testimony is not credible. And, um, you know, so it, it seems like she's inventing things, too, to back up her own credibility because it sounds better. You know, um, it, it's not quite clear, you know, where where the truth is with her, you know. Well, in the first book, she was trying to to exonerate uh, him. In the next book, she's trying to to say it was him. So that's yeah. that's, a, that's a big that's a big a pretty big there. And the yeah. stuff that she claims that she got the first time, I doubt. if it's that you. compelling, thank you very much. You, uh oh, it means we got three minutes left. We got so, three minutes. Yeah. Okay, it's it's <laughs> problematic, and it, it, the main thing is it's like I'm not trying to say oh she's you know she's terrible. Don't believe a word. But it's so problematic. At the very least, people should understand this. They yeah. should know if they're interested in either one of these stories, because so many people was like, oh, read Child Bride, read Child Bride. You know, it's, we hear it all the time. And it's like, well, uh, investigate the author. Yeah. And then let's. Yeah, that's that. a good that's a good point. Yeah. It's and, uh, you know, it's uh, Atlanta Nash would be another uh, person that I would point to, you know, in her book about the colonel she latched on to this story uh, of an unsolved murder in Breda, Netherlands, where uh, this person killed this, this lady shopkeeper. And, and someone there, years and years and years later, wrote a magazine article saying that, that uh, Dries van Kalk, the colonel, Colonel Tom Parker, could have been uh, implicated in this. He was never a person of interest. He was never a person. He was never sought out by the police. He was never questioned. But when you talk to people that read that book, they immediately said he murdered that woman. Yeah. You see, and she did it to sell a book. She did it to sensationalize this book and sell the book, in my opinion. And yeah. she's mad at me because I'm <laughs> out saying that. But I oh, believe man. that that's factual. I think, you know, I went to Breda. I went to the Netherlands and I talked to right, the yeah. department. I talked to local people that lived there and oh. said, do you believe that the colonel and the police department said it's an unsolved mystery? He was never a person of interest. You know, he was not even living in Breda when that happened. He was living in Rotterdam or had already left to come to America. But when you talk to the average person, they think the colonel murdered this woman and it's that's it. He murdered her. Yeah. You know, and that's the problem that we're talking about. That's wigwam on its face yeah. right there, because when you start suggesting that, especially in a book form where people are reading it, and I'll even take you back to the Elvis movie, you know, the, the bars, Baz, Baz Larman movie, 
people watch that and they believe that that's what happened. And it's not even close to what happened. But now when I talk to somebody that watched that movie and that's their only uh, uh, introduction into the Elvis story, they believe what they saw in that movie is the reality. And it's not reality at all. And that's what we're talking about, Wigwam. So let me ask y'all this. Can we do part two? Are y'all up for doing it? Absolutely. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, we're going to yeah. close this one out and we're going to do part two because we I want to let's dig into the uh the Natalie Wood um homicide. Let's dig into that a little bit more and let's talk a little bit about Wigwam and the Elvis community. Is that fair? That's oh yeah, fair. yeah, right. absolutely. So, yeah. so we're gonna pop out, friends, and next week y'all stay, y'all come back and we will talk to Daniel and Carrie and we'll do part two where we dig into this. I want to, because I don't know the details of the Natalie Wood uh, homicide, like y'all know the details. So let's dig into that a little bit, because I know y'all have got some little tidbits that y'all can help us There's with. There's so much wrong with that story. It'll, it'll be easy. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about that. And then let's talk about, um, let's go into the details of um, Wigwam, if you will, in the Elvis community, because it's, it's, Epidemic proportions, I'll say yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, y'all, we'll be right back. Y'all stay tuned.